Hello and welcome to the latest uh, PCD discussion on uh, moving to Switzerland. Uh, today we'll be discussing about all the considerations for high net worth clients interested in relocating uh, to the country. We're going to look at uh, tax um, at property, we're going to look at the way that corporate structures, trust structures are used. We're going to talk about the entrepreneurial scene uh, in the country, why it's attracting uh, business owners to move there to set up their businesses. Uh, also, retirees and people who've created wealth and are looking into their retirement and want somewhere uh, nice to live. So uh, we've got a great 45 minutes planned for you. Um, we are joined live on Zoom with PCD members. Uh, after 45 minutes, we're going to uh, run a little networking session for our members with our panelists. At that point, we'll wave bye to our YouTube audience who are very welcome to be joining us at the moment. Um, as always with PCD content, we love to hear from our audience. Uh, do put comments um, in the chat. Uh, that applies to both the YouTube and the uh, Zoom audience. Uh, we're looking out for your questions and we'll, I will bring those uh, live to our expert panel as we move through this session. So do let us know your thoughts, comments or questions and I'll bring them live to our, uh, to our expert panel as we move through. So just to open up uh, the conversation, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Ali Kanani from Bonar Lawson in Geneva. Welcome, Ali. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. So, um, Ali, you, you're a corporate lawyer based in Switzerland, often dealing with entrepreneurs. Just to open out this discussion, perhaps you could give us a flavour of, you know, why entrepreneurs are coming to Switzerland at the moment. What's attracting them? Mm -hmm. Uh, I have one of my partners in the, in the law firm who usually makes the following jokes that uh, entrepreneurs are coming to Switzerland for, for the Alps, the chocolate, the watches and the banks. But of course, it's, it goes a bit further than that because people, uh, based on my experience, people are coming here to Switzerland for legal and political stability, first of all. Uh, they want to make business in a you know, in a country where they are welcome and they can, uh, on an easy way, do business. They also come here, uh, and we notice this trend for, for the past years, in order to also have some confidentiality uh, and in opposition or contrary to what we can see within the European Union with the UBO registers. We still have UBO registers in Switzerland, but it's really limited uh, to uh, the company itself. The company has to have a UBO register. And I'm really trying here to focus on non-tax criteria uh, for entrepreneurs to come to Switzerland. Um, the other point that I can also mention is substance issue. We recently, uh, last year, we, we moved a company from, uh, from a European uh, Union country to Switzerland in order to be compliant with the international uh, environment from a tax point of view there, uh, because uh, the new tax legislations in the domestic uh, countries in, in, within the OECD uh, member states, they try to combine uh, the taxation where the substance really is of the company and where the activity takes place. Mm. So in, in that way, uh, people are coming to Switzerland in order to be, you know, close to their substance for trading companies, for instance, uh, and we will see other examples. Uh, they also come to Switzerland, and this is, again, not a joke there, but for banking facilities. Mm. Um, it could be sometimes a nightmare also for people like uh, Middle East people who want to do business from Switzerland, but they still want to stay in their country of origin. They're opening a, a company here and from day one, they need a bank account. And that could be sometimes a, uh, an issue which could be really difficult to solve. But then we have good relationship with, uh, with bankers and uh, we, can, we can easily, I mean, we can find some solutions. Okay. And if we look at the, uh, the trend from a legal point of view, I would say that uh, uh, high legal protection in Switzerland for investments, uh, flexibility from a labor law point of view, you can hire and fire, very easy. Uh, of course, it's, it's not what we, uh, what we sell as a, as, a, as a criteria to, to come to Switzerland, but it's really something uh, foreigners, entrepreneurs like uh, in Switzerland. 
and especially when you come from uh, France, for instance. So, and it's also very easy also to get in touch with investors in Switzerland and to, of course, raise funds for startup, startups, for, for instance. Okay, thanks. And um, there have been, uh, there was tax reforms that have been going on recently to help create incentives for businesses to come and set up. So I'm just going to share a little bit more information about that. But why don't you just tell us uh, what those tax reforms have done uh, for the, yeah. uh, for the a, country? A bit of history points here, because I mean, it, in my view, a personal view, it's, it's that this Swiss tax reform is really, is a really good reform. But it arrived a bit late. Uh, I would say they were five to seven years late uh, on, on the schedule uh, from, a, from a business point of view, because people were waiting for, for this uh, tax reform. And it entered into force beginning of last year uh, in many cantons. COVID year, nobody really cared about what is the tax reform in Switzerland. But if you go if we just uh, I put a list of the various uh, incentives that you can find in the in the corporate so the next reform, line. there were um, a downside uh, of the of the tax reform, the abolition of current uh, rulings uh, that were implemented for trading companies, for holding companies. That was a, a downside. But then they also introduced a patent box, R and D super deductions that we already know in other European countries. Uh, we can also find some, uh, uh, some modification of the capital tax where we reduced capital tax in order to really um, make it almost nil uh, in many cases. And on the other hand, we also increased uh, some of the uh, taxation for individuals uh, who are owning substantial uh, shareholdings in, in their company, um, but not, not, not a lot. Um, and the main, I would say the main reform that we, uh, that we implemented in Switzerland is the reduction of the corporate tax reform. And if you go to the second slide, <clears throat> I just put some of the rates uh, here um, for the main cantons. I don't want to offense uh, our Italian friends or any other Swiss German friends. Uh, but uh, if you look at the canton of Vaux and, and Geneva, especially, they reduced the corporate tax rate below 14%. And this is really uh, so competitive on the, on the international uh, scene. Uh, if you look at Ireland, for, it, for instance, it's 12.5%. But then if we accumulate this, this very low tax rate with the other uh, benefits that I mentioned that you can find in Switzerland, it's really good to be and to, to do business from, from Switzerland. Okay, great. Um, well, I'll just stop sharing that. And, and, and what, about, um, what about the business environment, Ali? I mean, is there a lot of red tape to find people who move in, find it easy to do business, to get things done? Uh, you contrasted before with the employment position maybe in France. So how do you find uh, entrepreneurs find the business environment in Switzerland? Yeah, usually they, they find it very friendly. Um, first of all, I mean, you, have, you can have a good contact with the economic um, promotion office in Switzerland. You have each canton with its own economic promotion office, but you also have uh, what we call the GGBA, the Geneva Burn. Uh, sorry, I forgot the name, but uh, promotion, uh, economic promotion office, um, and and they are really helping you to find the right place, the office space, uh, to help you to get the uh, work uh, permits. Uh, for people, uh, and really they, they help you to, to uh, establish your business correctly. Of course, you always have some administrative burden, uh, but like, like, you know, requesting the work permit could be uh, burdensome. Uh, but if you are coming yourself as an entrepreneur to Switzerland, bringing a high tech, uh, for instance, uh, to, 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 to Switzerland, um, or any other type of activity that is important 
uh, for the uh, economy of the region where you are going to establish, then you are really uh, helped by the uh, authorities. And of course, then there are some compliance issues, tax, uh, social contributions, etc. But this is something very easy to deal with. So if you have a good professional team around you, then exactly. these yeah. problems are easy to navigate. Yeah. And I mean, do you find that entrepreneurs are attracted to certain like strategic benefits on, you know, the time zone, the infrastructure of the the country, um, the, 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 the training that the, the trained workforce? I mean, what, what is it that you think um, attracts uh, entrepreneurs uh, to Switzerland amongst those things? Hmm. I think one of the, uh, it was in, in 2015, quite a few years ago, uh, one Irish group from uh, US origin, they moved to Switzerland because they wanted to be out of the Eurozone. So they wanted to be in, in, the, in the Swiss franc zone mm. uh, by chance. And, and really, I mean, that was one of the reasons. Last year, we saw an Asian company moving to Switzerland because they wanted to be, you know, in a, in a um, time zone which is friendly from a US and from an Asian point of view, and of course, Europe. But uh, really, they, they were doing business uh, all around the globe. So uh, time zone is also uh, something important. Um, and you know, uh, for, for startups, it's really important to have a direct access to our Swiss uh, polytechnical universities like uh, in Zurich or in Lausanne. If you look at the startup hubs around the Lausanne uh, Polytechnical University, it's just amazing. And not only for entrepreneur in, the, in that case, but also for investors. Mm. They are looking for the good, you know, the, the good company to or the good technology to invest in, and and uh, and and uh, Lausanne is in Zurich are really uh, the greatest city for that, and we also have the uh, the Crypto Valley uh, in mm. Zug, and a little bit in Geneva they try to uh, compete with Zug, but these are the uh, the, the good reason to to come to Switzerland. So there are some good homegrown. Swiss companies that are based on the knowledge economy that are growing up alongside those that are being attracted in, exactly. which sounds very interesting and the vibrant ecosystem that exists there. Are there any examples of any international companies that have moved in that, that I think you think are illustrative um, of these, of some of these points that we just discussed? Yeah, I told you that the, the um, uh, Asian social media company mm. just wanted to be in a um, time zone which is uh, comfortable for them to do business around the world uh, but of course I mean uh, they in some cases they also want to avoid any uh, countries that are um, putting some bans on their products so they prefer to be in Switzerland you know in Switzerland you can have a good IP protection also you can uh, also use perhaps the Swiss made in, in some cases, which could be a, a good opportunity on, on, on the commercial level. Um, and, and last year, we also moved this um, uh, headquarter um, from Luxembourg to Switzerland for our hotel group. And they wanted to be close to, to, to where the substance is. So they moved to Switzerland. And of course, in Switzerland, you all always have, I didn't talk about uh, it, about uh, withholding tax on dividends or deemed dividends. And that could be also an issue uh, in Switzerland. But if you take every steps before migrating to Switzerland, your business, then you can really uh, mitigate uh, these um, adverse uh, consequences uh, from a withholding tax point of view. And generally it's very easy and very comfortable in Switzerland to just take the phone, call the tax authorities, share your views on, on a factual background that you uh, that your client provided you with and then you know i mean it's it's very comfortable then you can get a, a, a written ruling if you respect the factual background put on the uh, ruling it's it's very um, secured from a tax point of view okay well many thanks ali for for setting out there the entrepreneurial environment and the reasons why international entrepreneurs are being attracted well, to Switzerland. Yeah. Very helpful background. Just going to bring in Thomas Serizé uh, now from uh, Lombard Odier in Geneva. Welcome, Thomas. Hi, everyone. Hi, David. 
Hi. So, so just just picking up on some of the private wealth um, aspects for for people looking at relocation uh, into Switzerland. Um, what are some of the immigration options that are available to those who are looking to move without the kind of business interest that that Ali mentioned? Yeah. Well, Ali already saw how great Switzerland is, uh, and. To explain how you have to uh, showcase that you are eligible to live in Switzerland, let's take the image of a club. So Switzerland is a great club, but you have to be admitted. And the fact is, is that admission is a bit more easier for EU citizen than a non-EU citizen. Uh, as uh, you know, Switzerland is not part of the EU, but there are freedom of movement agreements between Switzerland and the EU. And therefore, getting the right to live in Switzerland is easier for EU citizens. In, in fact, if you are a retired individual, you only have to showcase that you are able to uh, ensure that you uh, have the sufficient means to uh, finance your personal expenses and that you are able to uh, subscribe to a health insurance. For non-EU citizens, the rules are a bit more strict. Um, and uh, apart from the two I've already exposed about those individuals who do not wish to work in Switzerland and need to showcase that they are able to finance their own expenses and subscribe to a health insurance, they also have to be older than 55 years old and be able to evidence that they have strong links with Switzerland. And that can be quite a difficult task if you have never been in Switzerland uh, in the past. But what is important to know, and Hadi uh, already stressed that, is that Switzerland has a very pragmatic approach to that kind of issues. And showcasing strong links may simply result in being a good taxpayer for the canton in which you decide to live. And that is why we have in Switzerland, Russian citizens who live here, Chinese citizen, citizens from all the world, the world. It's only that it's a bit more expensive for them to settle in Switzerland. Sure, and um, choice of canton is critical in terms of those looking uh, to move in. Can you explain a little bit about how uh, that has an impact for tax? And I'll just share a, a little slide um, while you're uh, starting to explain that. Yeah, so um, Switzerland is a federal state and is composed of 26 cantons. And the particularity in terms of, of taxation in, in, in Switzerland is that the rules slightly change between each of these cantons. So if you live in the UK, you might not be used as, uh, as such a uh, strange uh, approach. If you live in Wales, you are not taxed differently as if you were living in England. However, in Switzerland, living in Geneva is not the same as tax-wise as living in Vaux or in German-speaking cantons. Switzerland is not a cheap country. Uh, it has a high income tax rate, it has a wealth tax. However, as you are all aware, it attracts high net worth individuals. And that is thanks to a specific tax regime, which is called the lump sum taxation regime. Basically, the lump sum taxation regime is a regime where you will sit down with the local tax administration, discuss about um, an appropriate amount of taxable basis, and then we will compute your tax liability based on that. Your tax liability will be totally decorrelated from your effective income or gains if they are generated offshore. And uh, to benefit for, from that regime, there are basically very straightforward conditions to meet. I will uh, just discuss about them in a couple of uh, seconds. Then I will highlight how exactly the tax liability is computed as it is shown on the screen uh, now. And then I will briefly discuss the length uh, of that regime. So the conditions to benefit from the lump sum taxation are very, very straightforward. You must not be already a Swiss citizen. 
you must not have lived in Switzerland in the past, or if you have lived in Switzerland in the past, you have must been away from Switzerland at least 10 years before returning to Switzerland. And last but not least is that you do not have to work in Switzerland to benefit from that regime. These conditions must be made by each spouse if a couple wish to settle in Switzerland. As soon as one of these conditions is no longer met, you lose the benefits of the lump sum tax regime. So these are the conditions, as you can see, very straightforward. Now, about the tax liability, how much does it cost this uh, very advantageous tax regime? As you will see, it's a bit more expensive than the remittance basis, at least during the seventh first year uh, of residence. It's much more expensive than Portugal, but after all, excellency has a price. So the rules I will be describing may vary between each canton, but basically it's, uh, it it's just illustrates how the system works. When, before, becoming a, a Swiss resident, you will meet with the tax administration and they will try to assess what is the lump sum amount that uh, you will be assessed against. And there, we will take just three bases and the bigger the amount compared to this criterion will be selected as your taxable basis. We will first consider your worldwide living expenses. Then we will consider a multiple of the rental value of your real estate. And then we will consider if neither of these amounts are greater than a minimum base amount, we will consider that minimum federal amount. And for Geneva, as shown in the screen, you can have a minimum taxable amount of 440,000 Swiss francs, that is the taxable basis. And on that, we will assess your tax liability, which give you, in my example, a tax liability of 149,000 Swiss francs per year, whatever is your wealth, your worldwide wealth. And for each of, of these cantons shown in the screen, you can reach out for different figures. Uh, and uh, the Valais, for example, is much more cheaper than Geneva uh, based on their local policy and also other factors. So this is basically why uh, Switzerland is an attractive jurisdiction for uh, wealthy retired individuals. Thanks for that, Thomas. And, and obviously, those who are wealthy and retired, in terms of their tax planning, inheritance tax is a thing that they um, are normally most concerned about. So, um, you know, what are the inheritance tax considerations of Swiss residents? So while Switzerland is expensive uh, in terms of cost of life or sometimes in terms uh, simply of tax, uh, it is quite generous on the inheritance tax side. And this has nothing to do or little to do with whether you are taxed under the standard rules or on the lump sum basis. Most of the time in most cantons, uh, the inheritance tax rate or the gift tax rate, when wealth passes from one uh, parent to his children is as expensive as 0%. So as you can see, it's a quite competitive rate. Now, Depending on the canton of residence, it can go up to 7% max, for example, in the canton of Vaux, but that is one of the most expensive cantons Swiss wide. So, as you can see, inheritance tax and gift tax are quite low, which also makes a lot of sense if you are a wealthy retired individual. Okay, and for those arriving, perhaps having already set up or the beneficiary of, of an offshore trust, how, how is that treated um, in Switzerland? So that's uh, also a key point, and especially in the Anglo-Saxon environment with uh, a trust being so key to uh, estate planning. And the key point that uh, PCD members need to remember is that Switzerland is a trust-friendly jurisdiction. And if I try to summarize the approach to how 
tax will be assessed uh, in a trust situation. Let's take a very straightforward example of uh, a non-resident non who has already set up a discretionary trust and wish to resettle in Switzerland. And the key questions that uh, a Swiss advisor will ask is whether the disinvestment of the settler of the trust asset will be recognized by the local tax authorities. And this can be uh, achieved by getting a ruling by, uh, issued by the local tax authorities. This type of approach just showcases how pragmatic, again, uh, the Swiss tax authorities are. They just look at the situation and try to get the best approach for uh, such a set law. Now, getting to that result may be complicated depending on the situation. For example, being only a settler of a trust, but settler and beneficiary as well is something totally different, but at least you can gain security and uh, insurances from the local tax authorities on a set uh, tax treatment for that trust. Okay, very helpful. And, and, and finally, Thomas, I mean, Switzerland's long been popular for British people to, to head to for retirement. I mean, what's the impact? It's early days with Brexit and, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're still starting to see the implications flowing through, but what's the implications for high net worth Brits perhaps looking at relocation to Switzerland? The first thing I'd like to mention is that why did the lump sum basis was created in the first place? only to get those Brits living on the, on the Riviera in Montreux. And historically, and it's true, uh, lump, the lump sum basis was basically designed for those Brits. How marvelous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, um, the, the Brexit had some impact and uh, the impact uh, is uh, twofold. First, because the UK is no longer an EU member, it reflects on how easy it is for a Brit to settle in Switzerland. From 1st of January to 2021, they are, um, uh, they are assessed or dealt with similarly to any non-EU citizen. Therefore, a very um, strict approach uh, is, is uh, followed to provide them with the right to live in Switzerland. It's not impossible, but it's a bit more complex. The second effect is on the lump sum basis. For the time being, it's not entirely clear what will be the definitive approach for, uh, from the tax authorities, but uh, we are in a middle situation where some tax authorities are inclined to deal with the Brits as in the past, as if they were still in the EU uh, uh, in, the, in the EU and provide them with very um, interesting tax conditions. Other uh, are uh, just following the consequences of the Brexit and uh, would like to tax them as if they were non-EU uh, citizen, which is much more expensive again. So on the tax side, uh, things are moving a bit. And for the time being, we, not, we do not have a clear position. Again, it's a good opportunity to discuss with the local tax authorities. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that, Thomas. Very, very helpful. Um, if anyone has any questions for Ali or Thomas, um, put them in the chat and I'll bring them uh, back on uh, to, to take them on uh, live. But thank you very much for that. Uh, that's that information that uh, Thomas very clearly set out. And I'd like to bring in Fred Ragno from Safri Champness in uh, Geneva. Good afternoon, uh, Fred. Hi, David and everybody. So um, we've heard from Thomas there that Switzerland is a trust-friendly um, jurisdiction. Uh, you work as a trust, um, uh, offering trust services to private clients as well as some corporate services. Could you perhaps give us a sense of how you work with private clients who are moving to Switzerland in conjunction with other advisors? Yeah, thank you, David. I, I think I think the, the the role of trustees has has evolved a lot lately, and we. We tend to be contacted by clients now quite early in the planning process. And it would be a discussion with families who basically they know they need long-term planning. Um, and I'd say the COVID situation has sort of accelerated that, that reflection. 
you know, uh, and, and, and maybe people now uh, at, a, at an earlier age, they ask themselves these planning questions. And so what we would do is help them basically ask the right questions, uh, have their families talk together about their values, about their objectives. And you know, we, we, we know that most problem can be avoided in the future if, if these discussions are, are, are taken early enough. Uh, so we try to prompt these discussions. Once this is done, let's say the, the, the second phase would be to design the planning. And here we're talking about Switzerland. So a person is moving to Switzerland. Our role would be to make sure the right specialists are, are around the table. And, and this is very important to stress because we as trustee uh, never provide the trust advice or the investment advice. So it's a discussion with Thomas, with Ali, with Meredith about how to implement a 360 degrees uh, solution for that Swiss person. And, and our role, having the big pictures on the family is, is making sure that anything implemented in Switzerland doesn't go against the rest of the family that are probably all around the world. Um, I have to say it's, it's very rare that uh, we work on a situation 100% Swiss you know, person moving to Switzerland might have a beneficiary in England, in the US, etc. So our aim is to overview the, the world planning and make sure it works for, for all the, dif the different uh, people in the family. Okay, thank you. And, and with that in mind, I mean, what kind of private wealth structures might a client use moving to Switzerland? Obviously, in mind that all situations are different and, and bespoke and tailored, but what are some of the common structures that people use for wealth planning? It, exactly, you, you said it very well. It's on a, on a case by case basis, but I, I guess to give examples on, on what has been popular uh, over the last decade, that say um, 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 an irrevocable trust is something as a pre-immigration rule, so settled before the person move move in the in Switzerland is quite popular because as Thomas explained the structure is recognized uh, because the donation has been done before um, um, moving to Switzerland this donation issue that is already small in Switzerland is get even smaller because uh, um, Switzerland recognizes and would accept the creation of that trust then of course we'll have to consider where this person was at the time of the gift and make sure it doesn't create a problem in that other jurisdiction. But yeah, I'd, I'd say that that's a popular tool to, 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 to come back on Ali's um, uh, presentation and for more corporate vehicle, we do see European companies being more and more popular uh, as, as opposed to the BVI Cayman and Bahamas, just because for several reasons, but one one of them being the tax treaties that this entity can can um, can enjoy, and and Switzerland definitely is in the conversation when uh, a group needs a holding or, or things of, of of these matters. Luxembourg always comes to mind, but the UK, um, Switzerland also are in this discussion. So that's also a tool that we can use now, especially because as, as Ali explained, the corporate rates is now so interesting. Mm. And is that recognition of, of trusts um, in Swiss law, does that give the trust industry a lot more confidence, gives clients more confidence in planning and how things will be treated down yeah. the line? I mean, what does that mean in terms of it being recognized, you know? It, yeah, it's, it's essential, I think, um, as, as, as it, was, it was explained before, we are a civil, civil law country, so, so the trust itself is not in our DNA uh, but this recognition that happened is, is very important. If, if we take uh, an, an, another example to, to maybe put some value on, on that, um, Latin America, uh, we work a lot with Latin America, countries like Brazil are civil law countries, just like Switzerland, and they have not accepted or validated the trust concept into their laws. And so they have the same interest in the structure and the same needs for structuring, but all planning you do is very uncertain. You know, there's no security on how a trust will be treated, how distribution will be treated. So in Switzerland, Switzerland we have that chance that 
there's some security and some stability, we know how trust will be, will be treated. And, and so you can plan for long term and sit back and relax a bit more, I'd say. Okay, thanks. And I mean, do you observe any trends for clients in terms of where they like to live? Do they go for the city centres or more rural or is there any, is that, how do you work with clients who want to understand more about where they should live? Well, the first thing is I'd, I'd, I'd say that uh, Switzerland is a very, very small country. So you, you often have the, can have the benefit of the two. You know, you can live uh, on a mountain and, and, and be less than an hour away from Geneva. So you, you, don't, you don't always have to choose. But, but I'd say what we see um, the most it remains around the cities and because we have more experience with the, the French part of Switzerland, but definitely G Geneva and Vaux would be the main, the main one. And maybe to go back on the presentation, uh, I'd, I'd say there's two types of immigrant in Switzerland. It, it, there's the, the, the workforce and the entrepreneurs, just as per Ali's decision. And for those, the, the consideration of proximity to their work will of course be a big factor as well. So we'll see mainly Geneva and, and, and Vaux here again to be close to these multinational or to these banks. And for these people that come for, for work, there's a, a revenue consideration as well, you know? So, so we have discussion about purchase power with them. Yes, it might be more expensive, but you come for a higher revenue. So they see things a little differently. Um, and then the others, as Thomas explained, is uh, coming on the forfait or lump sum. Uh, again, Valley, uh, Geneva, Vaux are the most frequent. We see, we've seen a lot of interest. I would, I would add uh, again for COVID reasons to Switzerland because Switzerland has been perceived as really, really, really effective during this crisis. There could be discussions whether this evaluation is correct or not for, for us living in Switzerland, but, but certainly, uh, and, and I've, I came across studies as well, that it's by far the top European jurisdiction as it's perceived. So that's, of course, now things that were not relevant at all in the client's mind. Now it's probably worth more than a few thousand here and there um, in, in the total cost. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Fred. That's very, very helpful. And, and, and on that note, I want to bring in Meredith Davis. Uh, good afternoon, Meredith. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, David. So you're a property advisor, uh, Meredith, based in Switzerland, dealing with high net worth clients, buying not only, but as part of your client uh, book and uh, processes, uh, looking at luxury alpine uh, real estate. So what we're going to do now is just walk through a couple of the key different areas which are accessible via... Um, Geneva. So I'm just going to pull that up on screen uh, right now. But why don't you just explain uh, the sort of clients you deal with and a bit of your background from Switzerland? Absolutely. Um, I was just going to mention, actually, that um, I had a conversation a few years ago with uh, the UBS uh, high net worth uh, team in Sion, and uh, I was looking for uh, a lot of the information that the rest of the panel have given to me during this conversation. And actually, he just said to me, just look out of the window. And, I, you know, it just sums everything up. <laughs> this is an absolute paradise. And why wouldn't you come here? So in brief, I am Meredith Davis. I'm founder of Tristan Davis Real Estate. We have been located in the Swiss Alps since 2015. We are steadily building a reputation in the luxury off-market property sector where you will not see our properties advertised online. So we advise and assist our clients with alternative finance renovations, and many other services through a broad network of professionals. So with slide one, we will now visit some of the prime resorts and property that are accessible from Geneva. Uh, before we do so, it's important to note that the Swiss uh, Alpine resorts have stayed open throughout the pandemic, providing a haven for those wanting to embrace nature. And this has been quite a unique situation in Europe. So from Geneva, we'll pass around the north side of the lake and we'll uh, pass through the cities of Lausanne and Montreux. And our first stop will be in Stad, which is to the northeast of the lake. Slide two, please. <laughs> 
Stad is home to a large ski area. It's bound by numerous shops, restaurants, art galleries, hotels, and designer labels. Um, prices in the luxury sector, as quoted by UBS in 2019, were 33,500 francs per meter squared. Um, so as an example of a chalet for sale this year of 6 million francs, which was coming in at 27,000 francs per meter squared, that had 220 meters of habitable floor space, eight rooms, and a land plot of 1,100 meters. Uh, slide three, please. So Verbier, we head into the sunny canton of Valais, which you've heard mentioned several times. This is home to several luxury alpine resorts, but also key to the wine production and the best fondue cheese you'll ever eat. Uh, the photo shows a chalet previously listed at 14.9 million francs, which is 25,000 francs a meter squared. Uh, this is actually coming up for auction in April next month. Um, the, it has no reserve, by the way. Uh, the total space uh, habitable is 590 meters squared, and this has eight bedrooms and six bathrooms. Um, prices in the luxury sector quoted by UBS for Verbier 2019 were 26,500 francs per meter squared. Uh, just to cap that, Verbier is very, very well known by the British. Uh, the British royal family, uh, Richard Branson, has a boutique um, hotel called The Lodge, uh, which has more staff than, um, uh, than clients. And uh, James Blunt has a lift named after him to name but a few. Uh, slide four, please, David. Um, so we move to Nanda. Um, the off-market chalet in the photo features a floor space of over 200 meters squared. Uh, we're looking at the indoor pool with the beautiful views. Uh, this has six bedrooms, five bathrooms, um, absolutely stunning views as you can see, and that is available for 3 million francs at 15,000 francs a meter squared. Um, Oatnanda is linked to Verbier's mountain lift network and sits above the town of Sion, which is the capital of the canton of Valais. And Sion has an airport with uh, private jet and helicopter transport services, which many residents in the luxury sector can benefit from. Um, to cap uh, Sion, it um, has an efficient, reliable trains which connect Sion to Milan, Geneva, Paris, as well as Zurich. And slide five, please. Uh, Cron Montana uh, is located across the valley from Nanda. Um, the photo shows the Omega Masters Golf World Tour. So Tiger Woods and all, all the other very big names uh, play there every year. Um, the shops, skiing and other facilities in the resort are second to none. Uh, Cron Montana receives an astonishing 220 days of sunshine a year. Uh, James Bond, aka Roger Moore, made it his home and many wealthy individuals choose to have their real estate in the commune uh, of Lens, which is a suburb of Cran, um, who negotiate the uh, lump sum tax deals that uh, the rest of the panel mentioned. Uh, we have an off-market property there as an example. Um, it's uh, a huge 900 meter square habitable. Uh, the owner wanted total privacy and protection of his views. So he purchased 5,000 meters of land around the property, including some forest where he can walk straight into the golf course. Um, this has six bedrooms. Um, some of those are as big as 50 meters squared, an Olympic size infinity pool, and the price is 12 million francs, which is 13,300 a meter squared. Um, UBS actually quotes prices in the luxury sector as 2019 in Cron at 18,000 a meter squared. Slide six, please, David. Um, so we continue to Zermatt. Um, this is the upper part of still in the canton of Valais. Uh, the language here changes to Swiss German and we approach the amazing Matterhorn, which you can see in the view there. This sits very high above the actual resort itself. Uh, Zermatt is an incredible place. It's charming, traditional, iconic. Um, it's an all-electric village, so completely car-free. You'll see these uh, tiny little electric taxis wheeling people between the five-star hotels. 
Um, I call it an, one of the iconic resorts because you tend to find tourists go there 365 days a year. They don't go there particularly to go skiing. It's just the place to be. Um, we have an example of an off-market chalet, um, a 400 meter, 480 meters square habitable at 16.5 million francs. That is 14,000 a meter square. UBS, quote, the luxury market at 19,000 a meter square. Um, I'd just like to note, actually, interest rates um, are available from 0.9%. So the money can, can be, depending on your situation, quite competitive. Thanks very much for that whistle stop tool, uh, Meredith. I just wanted to um, chat through a couple of things with you, one of which is a major difference in restrictions for those who are not domiciled in Switzerland to those who are a domicile resident there. Can you explain how that affects what they can do with property and how they can um, purchase property? Absolutely. So if, if we don't have some sort of Swiss permit um, through either residing or operating a business or, or, or various different means, which uh, the rest of the panel could explain, a general rule of thumb is tourist properties uh, are available uh, above a thousand meters of altitude. So that rules out obviously most of the cities. Um, the status of the property must already be a second home. Um, in the resorts, they've set a general rule that the, all the houses combined, only 20% maximum can be second homes. So the very developed resorts were already on that limit when this law came in, which was around about 2012. Um, so that means you can't build, you, you, you can't do anything. You have to buy an existing property with that designation. Um, another restriction is on the size of the property. So you've seen some very, very big properties that uh, I've put up in the slides. And um, the land generally can only be 1,000 meters squared maximum. And the habitable space, so that's not including garages and cupboards, can be 200 meters, roughly, give or take. Okay. If it's close, then that they may allow it. Um, only one property per named person could be purchased. So you, you could not buy more than one in your own name. Um, and another just small point is um, you cannot resell your property for five years unless it's distressed. So this is to prevent anti-speculation and overheating of the market. Um, so you can imagine the situation that the market's been in great demand during this last 12 months. And um, so the transactions have uh, been increasing and increasing. The pricing is going up slightly. And we, we, you can see a situation where we're going to stock the stock of in the market for second homes is diminishing uh, and there won't be too much around. OK, so obviously crucial there to take, uh, take advice. Sounds like a bit of a minefield, but uh, one that people need to just uh, be equipped with the right advice around them. And, and finally, uh, Meredith, I mean, if clients have these properties, one of many homes, they're not there all the time. I imagine the maintenance on these properties is a bit tricky. What, 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 what do they do around making sure that these luxury properties stay that way? Yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, important, uh, particularly during the period that we've just had. Uh, some people have just been completely blocked. They can't get to the property. Um, they might have not had the foresight to set up uh, some sort of concierge service because they were coming or friends were coming frequently. And so I think it's uh, we, we provide um, all sorts of services. Um, uh, we've had a scenario uh, in one of the chalets where, you know, the heating failed burst pipes and so on. Um, so we, we dealt with everything for them. We dealt with the ins in insurance application, uh, all the tradesmen going in, uh, a lot of sending photos and, and discussing details and, and, and got it, everything sorted out for them. I think also, also a lot of owners said, we just can't get there this season. And the worst thing to do is leave your house empty. Um, we have a lot of wear and tear on houses in the mountains. It's better to have them used. And so we got those rented for them for the season to one, to one family. Well, um, we are going to say thank you for that, Meredith. We're going to say goodbye to our YouTube um, audience now. And our audience on Zoom is going to count.